Hello and welcome to The Last Standy, a board game podcast coming to you from several thrilling countries across Europe. I'm joined here today by Alexis. Alexis? From Belgium. Bonjour. And Audrey? Hi, everyone. And I'm your host, Finn. Today, we're going to be looking at some games for smaller group sizes, mostly two-player, really, by following the tumultuous tragedy of two teenagers pumped full of hormones, then dashing down tiles in a dynamic duel of dukes before finally Don Arkham's mythos. But before we get into all of that, it's time for the old last standy catch-up. Uh, what's been up with you, Audrey? Yes, um, nothing. <laughs> huh? um, uh, these um, days and weeks I haven't done much because of the heat, uh, etc. So yeah, we, we wanted to do a game of unlock, etc. So yeah, we, we wanted to do a game of unlock and ended up not doing it. Um, so yeah, I managed to finish... Um, a bust that I had been painting for four and a half years, <laughs> uh, which I am finally going to be gifting to my sister. I managed to snuck in the painting session to be gifting to my sister. I managed to snuck in the painting sessions between uh, the hottest days. <laughs> um, but yeah, really for me, I think that's it for now. What about you, Alexis? On my end, not that much either. I've been very busy outside of board games, busy outside of board games for the past couple of weeks, which is why I wasn't around for a while. Um, I've mostly played family game because I was uh, I was seeing a uh, family, and I I'm not sure if I mentioned it on the podcast because it's been uh, a few weeks since I was there. But I finally received uh, Mage Knight, the game that the year wound up. Woo! A big thanks to, to Fen again, and it's looking like I'm going to be uh, able to play it uh, sometimes next week, uh, which I'm very lo- looking forward to that, and maybe to talk about it in the podcast, uh, oh. years after everybody. <laughs> Definitely. Hey, uh, Mage Knight never stops being rogue games lists, and I think it should be quite high up in co-op games as well, to be honest. Yeah, it, it seems to be um, very much a sure value, so I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to try it. Outside of that, uh, I've started a campaign of Ultraviolet Gla- Grassland, which is a game that I think I talked about uh, in one of our earlier episodes. A game that I think I talked about uh, in one of our earlier episodes, uh, which is a, a sort of um, psychedelic rock RPG. Very interesting. Uh, every character in the in the group is completely different and uh, strange. I think maybe I'll talk about it a little bit more uh, in one of our next episodes. Strange. I think maybe I'll talk about it a little bit more uh, in one of our next episodes. But uh, for now, uh, what's up with you, Fen? Well, um, we've had a very pleasant time while everyone else has been suffering in the heat um, because we're located in the Baltic Sea. So the hottest it got was... 27 but on top of that we've got uh we, we have a heat pump of course heat pumps can also run on ac so whenever it's not been too expensive electricity wise we've just been able to put the ac on and it's just oh, but my partner's been like can we turn the ac off i'm too cold it's just been kind of fun when i've been role playing uh-huh. people in the uk i mean the, the uk if people don't really understand why they're suffering so much housing standards in the uk are for houses that get like they, they don't really hold the heat very well. Um, so in the winter, they're always a bit too cold. And in the summer, they're always like quite warm. And you usually open a window to deal with... Nobody has AC. Nobody has AC. I, I literally, I said to my family, I said, look, hey, because um, uh, my brother and my sister have babies, like very young babies, and they both have small dogs as well. Um, I was like, you really should consider getting an AC and, you know, just a cheap one. Um, just for running when it's completely unbearable. I was like, oh, of course, it's Britain. People think AC is a crazy expense, but that's going to change. Yeah. Yeah. Um, outside of that, uh, I just actually got uh, Warhammer Quest Cursed City. Um, oh. Mostly okay. to just put it on the shelf with the other Warhammer Quests. So I've still got the ever. ever. I don't know why I collect them, but I just do. Um, I think Alessia reviewed that in the past, maybe. So um, I don't know what it's like. I can tell you, as a somebody, you know, when it comes to the miniatures, I'm always really unimpressed with the storage that Games Workshop give you for their miniatures. These things have got tiny storage that Games Workshop give you for their miniatures. These things have got tiny little pieces that bend and break even when you're carefully removing them from the sprue. And then they just give you a box to chuck them in. 
you know, I know for the most part they're thinking about people putting their armies up on display in a little cabinet or something. Um, but yeah, this is this is something. Um, but yeah, this is this is a board game, man. So I'm gonna have to maybe get a Felder insert because um, this is not. <laughs> they're not gonna survive otherwise. Like sixty odd miniatures, and they're gonna break. Um, yeah, that's not going to be uh, pleasant. Not, not at all. So we've had such a mixed experience playing it that we think we need to play it a little bit more because it's varied from like some people having amazingly fun times to other people just packing up like at the end of the second generation and going, I'm just going to stop playing now if that's okay. Mm. So it's, um, we end up talking about Abomination, which I'm trying to figure out how I could compare and contrast my father's work in Abomination because both of them are like, that kind of gothic, horror-esque, Frankenstein's monster-inspired, doing, you know, stuff with dead bodies, you know, and that kind of bodies, you know, and that kind of stuff. And and can talk about both of them at the same time, because actually I think it's quite worth comparing them, because Abomination's actually way better than people give it credit for. But only if you play with the the official short game rules which cuts the game down from over three hours. The official short game rules, which cuts the game down from over three hours to about two hours. And it's great. That seems a lot easier to, to bear. Yeah, it's great at two hours. It's like when you get to like past two, you start being like, come on, could this just wrap up? But um, we'll, uh, I'll sit, try and figure out how I can talk about both in a session. We'll, uh, I'll sit, try and figure out how I can talk about both in a session. Um, sometime in the future. Uh, be before we move on, I just thought about something that I, uh, I wanted to add up. Uh, mm -hmm. I recently watched the movie uh, RRR, Triple yeah. R, from the uh, Indian director uh, Raj Triple yeah. R, from the uh, Indian director uh, Rajamuli. Uh, and it's, I think, one of my favorite movies ever. It's incredibly fun and action packed. And I would recommend to any other watcher to just uh, jump onto it. I think it's on Netflix at the moment. But even if it's not, just find a way to watch it because it is uh, extreme. To watch it because it is uh, extremely good. Yeah, um, I've I I watched it. I was very aware of it coming out. Um, I watched a. I I used to when I lived in the UK and we had more access to the cinema. I used to go almost every week to watch the latest Bollywood release. So I enjoy immensely how finally, uh, and we talked about this briefly in the Discord, how finally England's birds are coming home to roost on everything that they've done. Um, now that the yeah. country, now that Great Britain is starting to fracture apart, I should say the United Kingdom is starting to fracture apart and Scotland are very right. We agreed to stay in the Union because you said you wouldn't leave the EU and you left. So, you know, and of course, England's going, pray we don't change the deal any further. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I, I along with Miss Marvel, bringing up uh, partitioning as well. It's been it, it's been fantastic. And uh, Hollywood's always looked for British people to cast as villains. You know, Anthony Hopkins famously is Welsh and played uh, Hannibal Lecter. As did Brian Cox. He's also British. You know, there's that kind of thing of grabbing Brits to play villains. That's always been okay, but right now, people feel like the, the screws are being turned on them. I've seen a fair bit of pushback and people going, oh, we weren't like this. This is terrible. You're villainizing us. And it's like, uh. Uh, it, it's no longer uh, a British person playing the villain, but uh, Britain as a as a cultural entity being the villain. Yeah. Yeah. But go on with it. But some people go, oh, yeah, but uh, there were Indian um, like sergeants in the army and, you know, soldiers and generals and stuff. Uh, you can't say that they weren't a part of the the empire as a whole. It's like. That's what happens when you colonize a place. When you colonize them, then you absorb them into acting for your empire. That's like still what happened for a long time to the Welsh and the Northern Irish, Irish and the Scottish. Um, you know, it's just England. As an entity, you can get flushed down the annals of history as far as I'm concerned. Sorry. Robin Hood's all though. Yeah, it's a uh, it's a wonderful movie. I would seriously mm -hmm. recommend anybody to to get a look uh, a look at it because it it's, is it's just 
it's one of the most boisterous and fun movies I have watched since Ichthu Tigre, which was yes. brilliant as well. Like I love how over the top it is, and it's it's brilliant as well. Like I love how over the top it is, and it's it's like at that low end of almost. These guys are superheroes, aren't they? But they're not quite. But they might as well yeah. be. Yeah, it's um, it's brilliant. It's long though, isn't it? It's not. It's it's three hours, but honestly, I watched it in one sitting, and I and it's three hours, but honestly, I watched it in one sitting, and I I never felt like it was uh, it never felt too long for what it was. While yeah. a lot of other movies, I. Uh, you know, even if there are two hours, I'm like, eh, it could have gone with a 45 minute less. Uh, didn't need it that that. Uh, it could have gone with a 45 minute less. Uh, didn't need it that that uh, middle act that uh, that was kind of dragging. In mm -hmm. RRR, every single minute was worth it. And if they if there was like 30 more minutes of movies, I would have been okay with it. Yeah, I would have yeah. been very happy. I didn't watch it in one full sitting because I followed what happens. Very happy. I didn't watch it in one full sitting because I followed what happens when we used to watch Bollywood movies in the UK, which is there's always an intermission. And we could I felt when that intermission happened in the movie and I was like, OK, that's time to make another drink and, you know, pause the movie. But uh, yeah, it was there wasn't a moment where I was not. Um, right. Before we get on to the games in specific, I wanted to talk about a couple of interesting bits of news. Uh, so, first of all, I'm one of a lot of people who is affected by the Mythic Games situation. I kind of knew that I might get into this kind of problem, because back when I first backed, games didn't have the most sparkling of reputations on Kickstarter. Mm. You know, not like, I didn't feel like they were super bad, but I felt there was like, oh, you know, there's sometimes they sort of push it a bit. But they basically, as of this moment, have my game over somewhere stored near the factory or in the factory in China, I guess, or in the factory in China, I guess, I think it's made in China, and they are not going to ship it until I pay $69. Um, I can't pay $69 for two weeks. That's when I get any money. It takes a long time, you know, for me to get money into my bank account because of being someone who gets money via the internet to my bank account because of being someone who gets money via the internet. Yeah. Uh, so... They're not going to ship it until I pay. And then once I pay, I have to wait until it gets to go on the next boat. So I don't know when I'm going to get my Darkest Dungeon, which is a shame. It was looking cool. I, th I was hoping to talk about the whole experience as being, talk about the whole experience as being wonderful and great, because the miniatures are. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I'm going to put a button on this at the end of this little segment with some other stuff I have to say in regards to this. But... Uh, in the other form of Kickstarter, uh, Simon have announced Dune War for uh, Arrakis, uh, which is a reskin. Seem to be attached on it. Uh, War of the Rings is a very, very good game. It's a long game. It's an excessive game. It's a two-player game, really. They claim they have a four-player mode, but really it's only a two-player game. I don't think I'm going to go anywhere near this. Maybe at retail. Maybe. But I, it's, I, I don't know how they're going to rein themselves in. And on top of that, as we discussed before, the shipping. Mm. They, they've really... Especially right now where everything is going up. Yeah, and Simon have been one of those people who've been really bad when it comes to shipping as well. The uh... Well, shipping from, shipping from China seems to be very good back to pre-COVID levels. No. No, no one is. The, the world's in a new mode and it hasn't quite settled where we're going to be. I don't think... The, the economy is going to... Well, inflation is going to keep going, so we'll have to see. Yeah. Um, but in reverse of inflation, uh, a semi-expansion to Spirit Island in that it's still compatible with the existing stuff, but what it actually is is a self-contained Spirit Island where you have a board with the island on it and it has new spirits being made for it. Uh, it looks really cool and exciting, and I'm hoping this is something that really cool and exciting, and I'm hoping this is something that makes Spirit Island easier to broach with people who don't game as much, because Spirit Island's amazing and such a great co-op game with so much, so much interaction between players possible, and it's really hard to quarterback it. Um, we really need to schedule a Spirit. Hard to quarterback it. Um, we really need to schedule a Spirit Island episode. With yes. as, as many of us as we can. 
Yep, yep, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, it's... Uh, yeah, it's really, really good. Uh, I know David really enjoys it as well. Um, so I'm, I'm excited about this. I don't know if I'll get it. I'm hoping they release just the spirit separately because it feels a bit excessive for me to buy it, given that all the people who will play Spirit Island with me already play Spirit Island. So yeah, but I think it's wonderful. Um, I'm really excited about the new Dune Imperium expansion, which is yeah, it's looking, it's looking pretty good. I uh... oh oh. That that's that's up there. It's it's not ahead of obsession yet on my favorite game I played this year, but it's it's really good. Uh, uh what else? Well, we've seen across in the UK that COVID has um not gone away. It's still around, for, especially for people who go to conventions. My what advice, a surprise. my advice is, if you're going to any kind of convention or big public gathering, if you're vulnerable at all, you should wear a mask. And if you don't wear a mask, um, well. You're kind of tough luck if you get it, really, at this point. it's The, the new variant is in highly contagious. Um, and for people with comorbid conditions, in highly contagious. Um, and for people with comorbid conditions, quite dangerous. I'm not going to harp on about it any more than that. I'm just saying, like, have a think about it. I think our shucks is coming soonish. Um, so there's that. Um, then very briefly, I didn't put this note down, but I want to remember, uh, no, um, then very briefly, I didn't put this note down, but I want to remember, uh, no rolls barred are doing a blood on the clock tower Kickstarter. They're trying to get enough, uh, to, enough funding together to do more episodes. They, they do live in person episodes with like a full set and all sorts of extra. I think it's recorded in a theater, um, like a full set and all sorts of extra. I think it's recorded in a theater. Um, they looks like they are doing quite well. Uh, I only support them on Patreon. Um, I really can't afford to support them on Kickstarter either. But they, I, I really enjoy watching social deduction games. That's something I watch just about every day. I'll watch at least enjoy watching social deduction games. That's something I watch just about every day. I'll watch at least some Town of Salem being played. Uh, they do fantastic Blood on the Clock Tower videos on their channel. Uh, they got a whole backlog of them. You could spend hours watching it. The game is phenomenal. I think it's one of the best games I'm never going to buy because I think <laughs> on the regular and they need it's to... a lot of people to get, especially uh, in your neck of the woods. Yeah, yeah. Not just in my neck of the woods, but they need to be quite like up on gaming anyway. And um, we tend to play... Some of the people we play with are more towards the like lighter end of stuff is what they prefer. Uh, so I put it in the cart to see how much it would be with shipping and everything, and it was over 200 euros, and I went, for something that will sit on my shelf and be gorgeous, uh, it's, it's not worth it. So I... That reminds me, there's a great game on Kickstarter at the moment, but at the time the episode comes out, the campaign will probably be over. Uh, regardless, it's by Postmark Game, and we actually recommended another game from them a while ago. Uh, the name escapes me. But they basically make print and play games on a single A4 sheet. Uh, you just need dice and pencils, and they can be played uh, multiplayer. Uh, this one is about a diving expedition. It's a super fun travel game. I think that's a recommend for me. Yes, yeah, the original one you're, one you're grasping for the name for is Voyages, and the company yes, is Postmark Voyages. Games. You can buy Voyages on their website, so almost certainly this one will turn up on there as well. Yeah, uh, and yeah. for next to nothing. So yeah, Aqua, yeah, they got Aquamarine up on the site, listed for the kick. Uh, at the minimum, even if it's always going to be timely, because I imagine it's going to be up for sale on here. Yeah, um, probably as soon as the the campaign is over, which should only be four more days. So yeah, postmarkgames.com is the place, and yeah, what single sheet, fantastic. You can even be environmentally friendly by if you're not going to be throwing it away ever. I mean. That's a good use for plastic. So, yeah. Yeah, um, definitely. Uh, last thing before we go, then, is... Um, I personally have been, have been having a really rough time with uh, Kickstarter. Uh, because yeah. it has been a... Conti every month, I think, okay, fine. Um, uh, this has been painful, but at least now I can breathe and actually afford to pay for food. Because I can't eat cheap food, because I can't eat carbs. And there's been another bunch of like popped out of the woodwork going we need shipping we need more for shipping and some of them i have just said uh i'm not paying shipping we need more for shipping and some of them i have just said uh i'm not paying because um i can't afford to 
and, and, and have lost the product, basically. Yeah. My personal logic has been if they ask more in the shape of hey, we are doing new products that seem interesting like air on trespass, hey, we are doing new products that seem interesting like air on trespass Odyssey did, I'm fine with it. That's my personal policy. Yeah, mine, mine is like a threshold kind of thing. I was okay with Oathsworn. They were very respectful about asking for it and it was $19 very respectful about asking for it and it was $19 and I was like okay it sucks this is I know it sucks for everyone even the publishers this sucks for um but I was given a reasonable amount of notice as well that's what's important is like yeah. mythic games hammered this thing out with like less than a two week deadline to pay it's hammered this thing out with like less than a two week deadline to pay and I'm like give people a month yeah. People get oh. paid on a monthly kind of schedule for the most part. Give yeah, them w- that month. I would even say two months. Some people just don't mm. have the, the have their budget on a month to month basis. No. Like a... and right now it's really tough. Food prices, food prices are going up. Energy prices are going up. I'm really glad we drive an electric car because gasoline yeah. prices are freaking crazy. Um, but yeah, so I wanted to just put a button on this at the end with saying, for a starter, with everything that's happening between the. Uh, between China and the US and Taiwan, um, we don't know what's called game kickstarting for full out because there's so many U- uh, uh, American companies who have their product printed in China. Yeah, and we see Most what happens them. now. If if China invaded Taiwan, then we would see sanctions, and that would be it. Like you know, Kingdom Death could never get get ever get released. Now, Fadam has been talking about. Uh that the price of shipment is going to go up. And the, the fact that he mentioned it makes me wonder that um, it's it's probably uh, even a worse sign than, than some other publisher. Yeah, yeah. I, um, I'm, but that that's another um, kind of one. It is. I, I'm waiting to see what happens. But if it's sorted out, I just... I Because I, he's had so, many, so much time to be ready for all of this. But anyway... Um, what's done is done in the past and the Kickstarters you've backed, you're going to have to deal with it uh, however you can and make your decision if you want to throw more money after, you know, good money after bad money, If which is what I did for a few. I've just gone, fuck it up. Um, I would say any Kickstarter that comes out now and you're interested in it, maybe back for a dollar and ask what their distribution and shipping plan is and if they've got one in place in advance and they're not, if they can promise to not spring out extra shipping costs on people, because this isn't going to go away. And yeah. I'm pretty just read today uh, that there's one chap who's very disappointed because uh, something he's backed, they're asking for, I think it was $360,000 extra to sort out their shipping in total. So, yep. Well, that's that's my my professional, as professional as I get advice, is don't back kickstation of them. And maybe this bubble needs to pop. I can still get uh, all the Kickstarters from La Boîte de Jeux because they do store delivery for free in France. <laughs> I'm cheating. That's perfect. That's that's yeah. what I do for some of my Kickstarters now. Is there's a shop on on the mainland in Stockholm who 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 orders a certain number of kicks who orders a certain number of Kickstarters, and I'll pre-book an order through them. I don't have to worry about that. I don't have to worry about shipping. I just wait until it arrives with them, and then they send it over, and that's amazing. Yeah, we have a few same, let's say, bulk uh, Kickstarter buyers and uh, stores. And yeah, that's you just have everything up front and done. Have everything up front and done. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, now it's time for us to move on and actually talk about some games in specific. So, Audrey, would you like to tell us all about a wonderful Shakespearean tragedy? Or is it romance? Or is it tragemance? I think it's both... Uh... Because we have the drama. I think it's both. Uh, because we have the drama and the romance. Even though I'm not really sure the romance. Uh, more. Um, uh, in French, we say idyll, passade. Um, more something, yeah. Not, not very. Iliad? Huh? I think uh, idyll is an Iliad. Huh? I think uh, idyll is an Iliad. I'm not sure, but yeah, so, some very short uh, passion that maybe wouldn't have lasted in either. Uh, uh-huh. Romeo and Juliet. So, Juliet, I'm going to talk about the box first, because the box is amazing. 
the box closes with a magnetic lid and when you open it, actually what you unfold is the board. All the sides of the box constitute the board. And uh, it's amazing, so you have these four sides that you open, both split uh, across the city of uh, Veron, and uh, the different uh, houses of the two families, the Capulet and the Montaigu, and one of them being Juliette's balcony, very important. Uh, on the middle, where there is still the box, you have a uh, another board, uh, which is there are cards, uh, two standees for Romeo and Juliette, and some wood tokens. Blue, red, for most of them, and there is a purple one. The blues and the reds are for the families. Juliet's family is in blue, Romeo's family is in red, and Romeo is in red as his family, Juliet is in blue's family, Juliet is in blue as her family. So these are the different members of the families that will be moving around the different locations over the turns of the game. If you, if um, members of opposite family meet, something bad happens. And the purple token is meet, something bad happens. And the purple token is for the hatred. It's just because there is so much hatred in this city that there is a personified hatred that moves on the board. Mm. Yeah, so uh, there are a few scenarios uh, in, the, in the game which are made of mini cards. Uh, which gives the starting conditions, which are different places for each character to start, and some of the conditions due to the uh, event cards that will be at each turn, and there are uh, there is a difficulty gauge that's indicated. So there is the beginner scenario, the one that you play, which has nothing as time not. Um, the players will have cards, big cards, uh, in red for Romeo and in blue for Juliet again, uh, which are all the characters. And, um, no, not all the characters, but all the characters of their color and hate has the hatred, I think, two or three times. And the other cards are the locations. So each player gets a certain amount of cards from the characters pile and a certain amount of cards from the location pile of course only their pile and then every turn will be a uh, pile and then every turn will be uh, played in the same way which is um, players being able to communicate if you have a letter token you can say oh i would like to meet you at the church and the other person can use um, a heart token to say yeah i think um, a heart token to say yeah i think i can make it or mm, no i can't make it and you can have a system of counter proposal so that's the part of the uh, social deduction game uh, a bit so as soon as the players have agreed on uh, a location or on, on not a location, uh, a location or on, on not a location, this phase ends, and then each player chooses uh, in their hand a location and a character card and uh, puts them on the table hidden. Then, when everyone has chosen, the cards get revealed, and what happens is that Romeo and the cards get revealed, and what happens is that Romeo moves his standee at the location that he selected, and he moves as well uh, the character that he selected. And Juliet does the same. And then, depending on um, if uh, characters from opposite families are somewhere, to get you get uh, points, or victory points, or hatred points. Um, the hatred points are bad, the victory points are good, and you mostly get victory points by putting Romeo and Juliet together, and the balcony so basically, which are mostly that if Juliet is at the same space as um, uh, Nana, she gets a letter. That's the main way to get a letter. Juliet has to arrange to be with her Nana to get a letter. In my opinion, that's the slightly problematic because at some point the letter and the letters end up being very scarce. And at some point, the only, let's say, um, 
deduction that remains is oh I know that my partner has already played pl played all of these locations so they probably have uh, this place and so they probably have uh, this place and if they paid attention to what I played they know that I have these two places left and so we can meet together at that last place and so I don't really like when you get to the end of a turn because you know who has which cards in their hand. I would have revered uh, if the game had cards in their hand. I would have revered uh, if the game was a bit more centered to sending the letters and communicating to meet somewhere and a bit less of oh I can track the cards and know what's going to happen. But you still have to know the um, the composition of the character's card, as I said, Romeo, for instance, has two or three composition of the character's card, as I said, Romeo, for instance, has two or three times the hatred, so you have to know to guess what uh, he has left in his end. But, yeah, I think that the social deduction uh, aspect of the game could have been a little bit better and be less of a card counting game. A bit better and be less of a card counting game. But the game is still very beautiful, um, that's the, and, it, and it's not a very expensive game to be honest. So I'm personally willing to pass on uh, this floor. I, I have to say, like, I really appreciate a game that uses every inch of its box, and this one goes a bit beyond that by using yeah. every inch of its box and all of its lid. It's a very, yeah. very pretty, very striking game, and honestly, I'm kind of surprised none of the bigger um sort of youtube video channels have dug in to talk it's a classic um shakespearean tale and yeah. uh, there aren't many adaptations of it so that's that in itself is interesting uh oh boy that cover's fantastic you have yeah. to you have to you have to pull romeo and juliet apart to open it up oh that's that's a nice little touch yeah. well i i don't think much of the the story of romeo and juliet um I always got very cross with how stupid it was. Yeah. Uh, but this this does look um, kind of fun and a bit like Mantis Falls. It's sort of sitting in its this smaller space of social deduction for two. What's that as well? But that's far more role playing orientated. Mm. So yeah. Theater scene. Oh yes, I can see that now. It's meant yeah. to look. It looks very pretty. That's that's the one thing that uh, that I need to say. I've yet to to have the chance in the way that the game looks. Yeah, the problem is that I suck at these kinds of games. <laughs> uh, so it's not that I don't want to play it or whatever, but uh, I, I I'm just bad. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, but but yeah, that, that, that's also why maybe I was crying for more letters because deduction games would say no you have plenty of letters but uh, you, that... <laughs> you mentioned by the way that there were uh, different chapters i was wondering if story-wise there was a big difference like in, in sort of the way that things are are going uh, to be played out or uh, is it mostly just the difficulty thing uh because hmm. um so there is the starting uh setup and then you have um, four turns. And at each turn you have an event, which uh, is something like, oh, I'm going to uh, open the box again and fish for uh, one or two, just to give an uh, example. And the uh, one or two, just to give an uh, example. And these um, different chapters will restrict the list of events that you can or cannot uh, use. Um, so, for instance, and yes, uh, each uh, event is linked to a spot on the board. Each uh, event is linked to a spot on the board. So, basically, some events are always at the beginning of uh, the, um, the story, some are mostly at the end. Um, so, for instance, um, oh yes, also each location has a special effect when you get there, you can do something which is generally... Each location has a special effect when you get there, you can do something which is generally move tokens. Um, 
So yeah, so here I have an event which says that if Julio, uh, Romeo and Juliet can meet at the um, uh, ball hall of, of the Capulet family, uh, you get an extra love uh, token. Of the Capulet family, uh, you get an extra love uh, token. Uh, for instance, um, or Mercutio moves where Romeo is, um, the characters adjacent at the Veron Street uh, go there, um, the Montague parents move to the ball hall Capulet, etc. It's not very uh, um, narrative. Mm, I see. You, you could say that the game is more of a hide and seek uh, between Romeo and Juliet than uh, uh, a storytelling game. Okay. I do appreciate how not only has it got these chapters, but it's also got this sliding difficulty. Uh, I I don't think we get listened to by many board game designers, but if you are a budding board game designer, one piece of advice I really have to give you is if you're making a game where you think, oh, I could put some different difficulty modes in this, put them in, because there's a whole load of people who they don't want to play on an easier mode if they if they're house ruling it because they feel like they're just going against what the designer intended. So I raise my hand. <laughs> yep, yep. But that's one of the things I like about Spirit Island. It goes, yes. okay, you can play it like this, or you can play it like this, or you can play it like this. Or you like about Spirit Island, it goes, yes. okay, you can play it like this, or you can play it like this, or you can play it like this, or you can go all the way up to this and this. And as you get better, you can step further and further up. And that stops yeah. that initial play experience of, oh, this is too hard. I, I can't stand this. Um, yeah, I, was... I, I was going to mention Spirit Island, which is just amazing on that front. And I was going to mention Spirit Island, which is just amazing on that front. And yes, Romeo and Jet is good as well there. Yeah. We, we need more games uh, that way. Yes, yeah. This is making me... Yeah, oh, Mantis Falls is on the fans also like, so there you go. Uh, I wasn't far off. I'm kind of surprised Mr. Jack isn't appearing, um, you know, where people have rated... Uh, Romeo and Juliet and then they've also rated other games and to see what the crossover is it's quite interesting at times to find stuff that you might be interested in uh, after, based on what games you like um, that, I'm seeing RRR is on there but it's not anything to do with movies so that's just <laughs> a happy, happy coincidence it's Mr. Oh, Mr. Jack's adversarial because you play one versus one but it's also social deduction-y and, and everything um, I, I wonder if it's a bit inspired by a love letter um, by the way which is another uh, social deduction game uh, that is extremely simple. It's just a deck of cards where a player to get the highest level cards, but every card has a power when you discard it. It's very fun, uh, and it's also about uh, you know a love story and trying to gather uh, letters. So I was wondering if there there might be some uh, cross inspiration there. Um, another game that I would recommend. I haven't played it, so I am. We ought to uh, schedule, uh, schedule it today, mm. uh, Sunday. Well, at some it, point I have one. decided that I should just uh, stop playing too many uh, social deduction games. <laughs> as, as these uh, gaming sessions always end up with me being, oh, I suck. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> and I'd rather play two games that make me feel uh, smart, you see. Yeah. No, no that's, <laughs> that's absolutely right. You, you've got, it's always worth trying some new things. And... As maybe a kind of general rule, giving it like two, three goes and seeing uh, if that type of game is clicking with you. If it isn't, then it, just draw a line in it because we have so many different games because we have so many different in it because we have so many different games because we have so many different kinds of people. And, yeah. you know, like... Yeah, I I have a crap game in Romeo and Juliet, so on that front, I'm good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Well, uh, I think it's time for us to, uh, I mean, stay rough time for us to, uh, I mean, stay roughly within the time period-ish, maybe, sort of. Um, uh, Alexis, would you like to uh, talk to us all about this um, this game that seems to be full of a lot of wood? Yes, definitely. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, the Duke, and it's probably the chess, but... Uh, and the Duke is my favorite variation of uh, chess. Uh, that isn't just uh, exactly another version of chess, but just slightly different rules. Uh, the game is uh, also kind of inspired by uh, Shogi, the, uh, the the Japanese uh, game with pieces that uh, that have specific types of moves. Yeah, I can um, see that. Yeah. Yeah. 
So the Duke, I think the first thing to mention is that it's made out of beautiful uh, wooden tile. Uh, on each tile, you have the piece's name and its movement uh, paragraphed on. Uh, each tile is like uh, paragraphed on. Uh, each tile is like a little bit over half a centimeter thick. Uh, it's it's like it's very chunky, and I usually like that. Uh, it gives the the game a lot of allure, uh, I would say. But if you really wanted to be um, to just play, but if you really wanted to be um, to just play the game, I'm pretty sure that you could just uh, print it on paper and have it uh, and have it for extremely cheap. Um, so the way that the game functions is that on each piece, as I mentioned, you have the, the name of the piece and uh, shop. It would have a little uh, full black arrow on each of its corner, uh, indicating that it can move uh, the whole board's length uh, in whichever direction, but needs to stop at another uh, character. A full arrow means that it, it can go uh, all the way, but King would have just uh, black circles all around it to indicate that it can move uh, in all eight directions, but only one space. Um, and so the game has, I think, 30 or so different types of pieces that all have their uh, different type of movement and very different. Some pieces can even attack a dis at a distance. Uh, but the thing that makes the game interesting is that whenever you move your piece, you're going to turn the tile over and it's going to have a different uh, movement scheme. So it's all about trying to understand your piece's uh, patterns, trying to understand your piece's uh, patterns and trying to uh, game your opponent to position your piece at the right uh, at the right place, turn it over and be able to attack its more uh, important pieces. So do you mean that it's like a semi-memory? Uh, no, no. So do you mean that it's like a semi-memory? Uh, no, not really. You, you're allowed to, to look at the other side of your pieces and they're all sort of logical. So for example, the, the Duke, uh, which is the equivalent of the, the king for the game, uh, can move uh, horizontally, uh, the whole board's direction, but needs to stop at different, uh, can move uh, horizontally, uh, the whole board's direction, but needs to stop at different pieces. And when you, once you turn it over, it can move um, vertically, uh, the whole board, but needs to stop at pieces. So it's, there's usually a um, uh, reason to the madness okay. uh, to every pieces. Um, uh, reason to the madness okay. uh, to every pieces. The other thing that is quite different from chess and that I like a little bit less is that you, whenever it's your turn, you either move one of your pieces or you draw a new piece from the from a, a you're going to draw is then random. And that's kind of a, uh, that annoys me a little bit because it means that your game always has this, um, you can't really plan your strategy too much. You always are on the back foot whenever you, you draw a piece because it's mine. Um, it means that the game can be played with uh, any opponent at any level-ish uh, because you, you always um, have to adapt. Uh, well, you know, chess, if you play against someone that's played the game a lot more, that is uh, a lot more used to it, uh, you're probably... And whenever you draw pieces, you have to put it around your, your duke. So you kind of have to move your most important piece around to try to, to spawn new pieces closer to the enemy. And it always gives that, that little bit of um, strategy to it. This, it's a very interesting game. Yeah? This Summoner Wars... Yes, there's yeah. a little bit of that. Uh, there's even like a couple of pieces that are uh, more magic inspired. Like, yeah. uh, I, I, I think I, that I, I yeah. see. Yeah, I was just going to say that uh, a particularly big score in this is that um, one of my favorite characters from um, literature and film is in it. Only Porthos could invent a new way to disarm himself. The, the three musketeers and D'Artagnan are in there, which is ah. just love yes. them. <laughs> um. It's a it's a very interesting little game, uh, and I think it it works well. It also comes with a lot of different variants. Uh, one of them uh, has a 
basically an unmovable pieces at the center of the board that creates a it's not a very big board it's a five by uh, six by six um and that unmovable piece at the center creates a lot of different uh tension within the within the board yeah a little bit more careful because you have this uh i guess cover uh but in chess um I I like it a lot. Um, I I usually like chess, uh, so I think that the variant on it is uh, quite fun. Um, again, so yeah. that's not a game for me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't Pro like. Um, again, so yeah. that's not a game for me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't Pro like chess. Probably not. But if you have a, if you know someone that likes chess, it's a pretty good gift. I think that I the game do, is also I, I do, pretty the, cheap. It's... I do have a colleague that likes chess, and uh, for if any reason, who has that likes chess, and uh, for if any reason, who has the same birthday as and do t t ten years apart, but st same exact birthday. So if I want to gift uh, that colleague something for uh, this year's birthday, yeah, I think I'm all set. <laughs> It might be a good one. I think that the the game uh, is 40, forty. I think that the the game uh, is forty forty dollars when uh, when it's in stock. Uh, they have not um, had it in stock on their website in a while, but it's been on Amazon and on other websites. So look around, you might find it. Uh, it's made by the people that made uh, that are currently printing. Uh, it's made by the people that made. Uh, that are currently printing uh, BattleTech, uh, Catalyst Game Lab, um, and so you you can feel that they have this uh, this legacy of a um, tactical uh, ish game, and wanted to make something a little bit more uh, simple. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's the Duke. Very simple game. Uh, not too much to say about it, but I think it's uh, uh, it's something that i've been uh that i spent some time with in the past couple of weeks yeah it's um it's got a real 1980s vibe various pieces and it was reminding me of uh, i once upon a time got to play um uh what was it magic realms it's magic magic realms, yes is it? The, it, yeah it has also a little bit of that uh, early stratego art uh i feel um also same time period although it's 20 realm yes uh, one of uh, the guys I used to work with had a copy of that, and um, it has a, it's 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 very different game, very different game, obviously. Um, yeah. Magic Realm stupidly compl complicated, but <laughs> it just has an, a nineteen eighties vibe to it that I quite um maybe and the the very simplistic look of the mm. the pieces and the the, the little, little icons for every um uh from for every unit. Um, it's it's honestly a pretty a pretty interesting little game. Yeah, I could see somebody just with a you know a wood burst and tiles for this. There's a uh, that's actually interesting to mention because the game comes with a four empty blank pieces and tiny stickers that you can use to make your own pieces if you'd like. Ooh. Uh, you have a, like a sticker sheet with the the different pieces. Um, it's it's also a game that has pieces. Um, it's, it's also a game that has, uh, had a few, uh, floating, uh, mods and recommendation for like different setups. So mm -hmm. people that didn't like the randomization have like, uh, oh, start with those pieces and you can like replace them with, uh, this thing. It's, yeah. it's quite fun. Replace them with, uh, this thing. It's, yeah. it's quite fun. No, oh, it's um, it seems uh, it seems like a simple game that gets very deep. Yeah, and and they released a uh, print and play. Uh, so if you wanted to to give it a try, you can just print it on paper and and have a have a go with it. That's awesome. Yes, yeah. um, like a uh, developer that is not afraid of releasing a pre uh, print and play and just being uh, judged on their on their game being. Or a TTS. It's uh, yeah. yes. Oh, TTS, yeah. Yeah, because exactly. you yeah. you get to you get to, to to learn the game, know if you like it, but also uh, I I will say that as a backer or buyer, whichever, uh, supporting the game and not just yeah I'm going to buy it and put it on my shelves and forget about it, but because you have a deeper connection with it. Yeah, and, yeah. exactly, and it, it it's it's varying onto a very different topic, but I always 
like that idea of a game creator that just wants their game there and obviously they, they need to be profitable they need to to pay their rent and, and eat and that's good but you know uh, i think that there's, there's always a, a sort of um a uh, good feel about a, a game uh, game maker that just wants people to enjoy the game and doesn't seem to be a uh, so content maker that just wants people to enjoy the game and doesn't seem to be uh, so controlling about it. Yeah. I am definitely not sp uh, thinking about a very specific uh, uh, game creator that I have a, a lot of irks about. Uh, well, I have no idea what you are talking uh, we, about. We have no idea at all, but I, I would like to say... We, we have no idea at all, but I, I would like to say if if people were like, oh, more designers to just create their games and put them out for people to enjoy on TTS or like on print and play, etc., etc., if, if that's what you want, the answer is in three letters, um, and it's yes. UBI, Universal Basic Income, doing jobs that they don't want to do, that, that really don't need to be done, that should be automated, but capitalism is what it is. If you just give them a basic wage, you'll find a whole bunch of people who just start making things. You know? yeah. start, like, I've I wor been working on a board game on and off for quite a lot of time, but I need to do my, what my main job is. And I've yeah. kind of gotten off, like, the iron's not hot anymore. When I go back, I, if I could get the time to go back, I don't know if I could pick it up again. Because one has to eat, so... Yeah, 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 you know, but the, I love, I love this. This is a great little game. Um, it's got, yes, yeah, such a, um, it's got, yes, yeah, such a, it really, well, I would call, really call it an antiquated look that kind of appeals to me. Yes, it's very simplistic. And, and again, like the fact that it's all in, in wood and no, no plastic, no nothing, um, gives it, gives it a little bit, uh, a little bit of charm. Yeah. Um, Gives it gives it a little bit uh, a little bit of charm, yeah. Um, so yeah, that is uh, that is the Duke uh, uh, by I should have mentioned uh, the developer uh, first. So, Same, uh, it's I forgot. It's published by Catalyst Game Lab and uh, it's made by uh, Jeremy Holocomb and Stephen uh, McLaughlin. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, uh, and on that note, uh, Fen. Yeah, I was just checking the surname, McLaughlin, yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, I'm going to be talking about what I called an audible. Um, as I said at the start of the episode, I was going to talk about my father. I began thinking about it went at the moment. I think I might be bashing on the game too much and I need to give it another couple of goes because there's some really good stuff in there. Uh, so we'll come back to that maybe a month or two down the line when I have a chance to play a bit more. And instead, I'm going to embark on what I've been saying I'd do for a while. And oh. I'm going to talk about the new revised core set right now and one, one standalone expansion. And then in the future, I'm going to touch back when I complete various campaigns a few times and just be like, is this a good campaign or not in a short segment in the future? But... Uh, <laughs> With the way you said one, I thought you were going to start a count, uh, to start counting, and I was almost ready to say two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so, Arkham Horror, the card game, is a mouthful and it's a pain to find because it's part of the Arkham Files unions, which is in itself by, based on Lovecraft, uh, Lumni, August Dilith's works in the Cthulhu Mythos. Uh, this is originally a 2016 game and it just, I think last year it was, it had a redo into a revised edition. Now, I think last year it was, it had a redo into a revised edition. Now, what kept me away from playing it before was if you were going to buy this game originally, you had to buy not one, but two boxes of the core game because there was like enough cards for maybe one person in the core game and cards for maybe one person in the core game and really Arkham Horror comes at its best played either one player or two player or two handed solo as they call it where you control two investigators at the same time. It's a living card game so the first warning is right there big flashing sign style game warning big money sink. Um, and that's quite appropriate here because well, I'll get back to that near the end, but you'll see why I'm like, you can't just get the revised core game. 
you really can't. So, this is the Oms Off the Lord of the Rings card game that they did. And it's also tied thematically, design-wise, I should say not thematically, mechanically, it's tied to Marvel Champions as well. But uh, whereas the Lord of the Rings card game is kind of focused on a single scenario um, and Marvel Champions is focused on maybe short campaign campaign or a single fight against a single villain, this is very much structured around playing a campaign, customising your own deck and gradually improving the deck through the campaign as you'll get experience and you can buy updated or better or stronger versions of cards you already have in your deck. Stronger versions of cards you already have in your deck. So, the core game comes with five investigators, three scenarios which tie together to make a campaign called the Knight of the Zealot, <clears throat> and a load of cards to allow you to customize the decks after you've a load of cards to allow you to customize the decks after you've first played with them a bit. The basic decks, these are probably some of the worst that Fantasy Flight have ever put together. It's terrible. Terrible basic decks. Lots of garbage in there that you're never going to use once you start customising the Lots of garbage in there that you're never going to use once you start customising the decks. Okay for learning, I guess, but... But um, this is a lifestyle game! Money, money! It's a lifestyle game, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've got so many copies of Knife that I don't know what to do with it. Like, Knife, a card I do not put into a deck if I can avoid it at all. I don't know what to do with it. Like, Knife, a card I do not put into a deck if I can avoid it at all. Um, so, of the five investigators, this is something I think is quite interesting, is to... I, I've, I've looked at all the investigators and gone back to take a look at the original five and seeing how they hold up, because any lifestyle thing like this, as it grows, how it crept out. Marvel Champions has done pretty well with that, because about half of the characters in the core game are still near the top of like the power levels, which means they haven't messed up. Spider-Man, Captain Marvel, and to a lesser degree Iron Man are all still great viable heroes, and even She-Hulk and Black Panther. You have Roland Banks, who is your detective, he's your guardian. He does the fighty fight. That's what guardians do. They tend to punch monsters and protect people. He's okay. He's held up reasonably well. He's a lot better in solo because he can do a lot of investigating and fighting. That's the two things you want to be doing in this game. Um, than him. Then you have the seeker. Seekers collect clues. Uh, and they're like um, very poor at fighting. So they tend to need bailing out whenever a monster comes along. They're also quite bad at running away a lot of the time. Uh, and that is Daisy Walker, and she's still, I think, in the top five of the investigators in the game. Uh, then there is the Mystic. Uh, Agnes Baker is your Mystic in the core game. She is still a top five Mystic. So excellent. She's held up well. Then there's Skids O'Toole. So if you're a fan of a sneaky, rogue, criminal-style play, he's possibly... Maybe the worst or second worst investigator in the entire game. Which, that, that's kind of awful. Um, and you need to then be kind of targeted, how am I going to improve that situation? Good news, you can buy a separate individual pack for an investigator for Winifred Hammerock. Hammer, and it's all rogue and all day and she's an incredibly fun character and she is probably one of the three best uh, it, like uh, rogues in the game so there is an answer but it'll just cost a bit more money lifestyle game you know yeah yeah however i'm really happy to say that of the survivors you get when reference to wednesday adams probably um she's a little urchin she's still the best survivor in the game like it's close stella clark who is another standalone investigator isn't far behind her but wendy adams has held up and she, she does work, which is fantastic. So, does work, which is fantastic. So, that's like the assessment of, is, is this still good? It's like, yeah, for the most part, the investigators you buy in this box do the job. And even better, you can go onto Fantasy Flight's website and you can download and print off alternate that's website and you can download and print off alternate versions of all of these five investigators. Ooh. They're called Parallel oh. Investigators. 
They have a, se a separate front and back, and you can com either use both the new front and back, or you can use the new front with the old back, or the old back with the new front. So you can combine a bunch of different ways with the old back, or the old back with the new front. So you can combine a bunch of different ways. It'll change the way you build the deck and the way the character plays. A parallel skids doesn't completely suck. So there's a solution that just costs you a little bit to print it off. Or And if you really love him, you can get him printed by make playing cards. I sent off an order. I got, you can get him printed by make playing cards. I sent off an order. I got like make playing cards versions of all the parallel investigators printed out. Super happy with how they turned out. You sleeved up. They look just like the real thing. Lifestyle, yay, yeah, money, money, money. Yeah, money. Uh, <laughs> qu question mm -hmm. uh, spread apart, not in the comics then, but uh, the expansion and stuff is there a dog? There is. There is. Um, well, it, it's there's two. First of all, ah. you if you're willing to pay an absolute ton, and I do mean a ton Lifestyle, on the secondary yeah, market. Money, money. No, no, this is a secondary market issue. This ah. is a supply ah. issue. Um, if you're willing to spend maybe up to two hundred dollars, you can buy Barkham. A lot it, of money. Yeah, yeah. It it was released for a reasonable price, but it had a very short print run, and it's not been reprinted. So uh, demand has gone up because people love dogs. I'd love to get this. I keep mm. looking at it and going, I can't, I can't justify this price. Is it an investigator? Uh, so there, yeah. There's five investigators. You get, you get, um, uh, you there's Ash with his dog, and um, the way Ash can Pete works is Duke does all the work. So in Barkham, it's Duke with his little pet human. Ah. Yeah. Um, hang on. I, I've got... Let me Give me one second, because I wasn't going to talk about Barkham. Um, so, sorry, but... No, no, it's fine. I just want to pull up... Who... First more in Guardians of the Galaxy 3 and... Ah, and mm. Google and... Ah. Yep. Uh, let's see. There we are. Aquamiles. And I want Cosmo in Marvel Crisis Protocol. If the Atomic Mass Games uh, guys are hearing me, please bring us Cosmo. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, I maybe don't... Uh... Oh, there we are, Barkham. Right, yeah. Uh, okay, so the um, you got uh, Jacqueline K9. Uh, uh, you have... Yeah, Jacqueline K9, which is probably a reference to the famous uh, harness of Julius K9. Yeah, Jacqueline K9, which is probably a reference to the famous uh, harness of Julius K9. Maybe um, is she's a reference to Jacqueline Fine, the um, who might be that a reference like that. Um, we also have yeah, it is it's Duke and his uh, sidekick pet hu friendly human, um, his sub and his uh, sidekick pet hu friendly human. Um, his subtitle is I guess his name is Pete. Um, <laughs> you can get a uh, a Catalin gun. Ha. Huh. Yep. Uh, here we are. Here, here they are. There's um, Skidzo Drool, Jacqueline K9, Winneth Prup, uh, Duke, the good boy, uh, which who doesn't even have like most of them have an alter, an altered art of like the original character with a dog's head, but it's just a picture of Duke for that one. Duke is the same in all universes. He's wonderful. And um, Bark Harrigan instead of Mark Harrigan. So dogs, and there's even a whole campaign where you play as Anthropomorphized <sighs> as furries fighting against uh, <laughs> Meowlutep. So, uh, that's oh, great. It okay. is. I, I desperately want them to reprint it. But yeah, to circle back round, um, that's like the starting investor. The starting investigators hold up fairly well. The starting pool of cards has some staples that are very good. And you can build excellent decks out of them. You can go on the Arkham DB, which has like loads of different decks, and you can filter by your collection. So you can see people who've constructed decks for just using the starter as a pool. Or see people who've constructed decks for just using the starter as a pool. Or just the starting pool plus one expansion of investigators. So that's a super helpful resource, especially if you're playing on a limited playing field and you're not confident to build your own decks. Right. All right. Now, I suppose I should briefly talk about the flow of the game. I'm not going to get. I should briefly talk about the flow of the game. I'm not going to get massively into all of it because it's it's not a super complicated game to operate, but it does have a lot of steps. In essence, it runs a similar way to all of the Arkham File games do, in that the opposition in the game is the mythos, and it's a gradual clock that ticks down through agendas. And whenever you reach a sometimes cultist can turn up and make there be more doom, then the agenda will advance and stuff bad stuff will happen or sometimes the plot will move forward 
if too much of the agenda advances all the way to the end, then you might end up with the investigators being defeated or having to flee the scene or some really bad stuff happening. And then on the flip side of that is the use by investigating them with their investigators. That is, it's literally called the investigate action. And your seekers are best at doing that. And they will gather up the clues and you get enough clues and you could advance the acts and get to more sort of things happening and discover kind of st stuff that's going on. I'm not going to go into all the scenarios because I don't want to spoil it too much stuff that's going on. I'm not going to go into all the scenarios because I don't want to spoil it too much. But a good example would be the very first scenario you play, The Gathering, has you turning up to one of the investigators' house and then suddenly the door disappears and absolute mayhem breaks out and suddenly there turns out to be this strange crazy woman who's living in a part of your house. Suddenly there turns out to be this strange crazy woman who's living in a part of your house that's not really a part of your house and there's a bunch of ghouls attacking. And that it, sounds fun. It all unfolds really quite nicely and the narrative, considering it's not big large amounts of text, at least for the most part in the first game, is nicely done. There's storytelling where fun things happen like... Uh, I just played recently with a couple of my friends and we were in a disused theatre and I went, I wandered off to do the investigating. It was my job to do gather up all the clues and my friend walked straight into the ticket box area, ransacks the whole thing, stealing a load of stuff. He had a bit of and and suddenly I get all sorts of like cultists start piling on top of me and I'm like, I can't fight guys. Stop my job. <laughs> help, help. So uh, that was just me running around the entire uh, theatre being pursued by these cultists while freaking Calvin Wright is sitting there with a huge pile of resources. Later, I was like, oh. Uh, so, yeah, you will spend resources to play cards. You will try to manage your mind um, and ensure that it doesn't get too low with too much horror. Your character will be defeated. If you take too much damage, your character will be defeated. You can play cards, you can buy various weapons to make you better at fighting, or like a magnifying glass to make you better at investigating. There's a lot of different ways to play the game. Uh, even within the core set, it's quite nicely varied what you can manage to do. I mean, a mystic who casts spells to do stuff feels entirely different from a survivor who... So if they lose, fail their checks, or they get damaged, then they generally get better and stronger. So it's it's a lot of character to it if you like deck building which i love um and you like investigative stuff which i also love then this is a great thing is it's enjoyable to go through a scenario love then this is a great thing is it's enjoyable to go through a scenario for the first time and the story unfolds out and you don't really know what you're doing you don't know where you're supposed to go there's a few clues maybe in the flavor text here or there but you kind of you unfold it as you go uh, I like deck building games, but I don't like uh, Arkham and Cthulhu uh, stuff in games, but I don't like uh, Arkham and Cthulhu uh, stuff in general. So uh, let's call this episode the episode of games that are not for Audrey. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you, but you... you introduced one of those games. <laughs> yes, but it's not a game for me, actually. <laughs> hey, sometimes you have to play games that are not for you. Yeah. Um, well, Audrey, I've done a Kickstarter for a game called Earthborn Rangers. So that's going to be a wandering around protecting nature, I think, is the setting. I've backed it. I think Kara backed it as well. Oh, um, that, that should go to retail. Better. It's being sustainably printed. So there's a whole big kind of like we're trying to make it uh, well, and all that. Yeah, oh. it's and, and the people who are designing it, they have a great pedigree. So I'm very excited about seeing that game with that theme. So. Maybe when that hits retail, that might be the version of this sort of thing that you go, ooh, okay. Yeah. Finally. Yeah. So the last thing I'm the last thing I'm going to go through briefly then before we put a button on this and wrap it up is the Night of the Zealot, which is the name of the three episodes, three scenarios that come in the core game. The first one's the Gathering. It's kind of a tutorial. Uh, it's also really good to just put a investigator in and see if they can manage it. It's really good to just put a investigator in and see if they can manage it because it does everything. You need to be able to fight a bit. You need to be able to investigate a bit. You need to be able to stay up on your feet and keep going. So it's a good little test. It's not a super long experience. It's not very challenging um, on the whole, but you can play it at like harder difficulties. It's not very challenging. 
um, on the whole, but you can play it at like harder difficulties if you want to. It has its own scaling difficulty, Arkham does, which is brilliant. You know, you can play on a really, really hard mode where the, the game kicks the heck out of you um, via its customizable dice, which it doesn't have a dice. It has a bag that you draw tokens via its customizable dice, which it doesn't have a dice. It has a bag that you draw tokens out of, like Vagrant Song. Um, so you can alter the difficulty by putting different numbered tokens in, uh, which mm. is really sweet. And that sometimes in campaigns, the bag will get altered by new tokens will go in there. Me, I use an app called the Ar new tokens will go in there. Me, I use an app called the Arkham Chaos Bag app. Um, it does all of it automatically. I highly recommend it. And I highly recommend the Arkham Cards app as well if you get into deck building. Um, but the, yeah, I, I almost forgot about the Chaos Bag while trying to briefly push over the really, really good things about the game. Although, if you play the game a lot, you're going to need to put those tokens inside coin capsules. Otherwise, you will wear them blank with pulling them in and out of a bag. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah, Gathering's pretty good. Uh, the second one's called Midnight Masks. It's stupidly hard to do really well to, because there's a bunch of different objectives and you don't necessarily always achieve everything in a scenario sometimes you have to kind of cut your losses and deal with it or be like okay we failed midnight masks is like very much the gauntlet for how good is your deck how good are you at this game at it which is great and then the third one's called the devourer below and i i don't think it's a very good ending i don't mm. think it's great at all um so that the this is this is the worst campaign that they have, I think, um, in the core box, and it would be nice to the boxes, which gave you extra cards that you put in um, to allow you to mix up and replay the scenarios and adjust things a bit further to give it more replayability. They seem to have abandoned that return to series, and they didn't put the contents of the return to box into the main box, which I think is like. Oh, the return to series let people get their hands on the cards from the box especially as it has the dividers in it there's no card dividers in the main box they're all in the return to boxes and they're so helpful otherwise you have to make your own that's always a problem with a living card game uh when mm -hmm. they die <laughs> yeah i what, losing you know, really interesting concept is always annoying i i was a big player of a uh, netrunner for a while mm -hmm. well netrunner is still uh, going it is it is still going but for a while it was they were kind of hinting that yeah. maybe they were going to discontinue stuff and there it wasn't able uh, possible to get anything else and it's um it's always good to to not you'll be able to access your things yeah it's 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 just like they're still reprinting arkham horror and they redid the core printings and they just it was just a re-release of all the cards in a better box with better numbers and it's a, it's a better distribution model but they just, uh, there's a big question mark over these return to boxes, which are far, but they just, uh, there's a big question mark over these return to boxes, which are far too expensive for what they are. Um, I have one right next to me. I love the box. It looks lovely. It's like a little file index drawer and you pull it in and out and it has the entire of Night of the Zealot in it. Um, and also a couple of standalone scenarios, the Zealot in it. Um, and also a couple of standalone scenarios. And I love it to pieces, but it was far too excessive. And these were not, they didn't have as much material as I hoped they would. And I th was, I thought they'd at least fold this material into the core game. So, but they did not, they did not so, this material into the core game. So, but they did not, they did not. So what that means is if you want to get into Arkham, there's not really a good scenario like Marvel champions, which you could play and play and play again. However, before I wrap this up, I'm going to make a hard recommendation for a standalone. Before I wrap this up, I'm going to make a hard recommendation for a standalone scenario that sets the gold standard for standalone st scenarios, in my opinion. It's called Murder at the Excelsior Hotel. I'm not going to spoil the entire plot, but I'm going to give you the starting hook, which is you're walking down the street and somebody hands you a bit of paper and come to the Excelsior Hotel. I'm going to explain what's going on. There's weird stuff that's been going on. Everyone's very confused about it. The police have washed their hands of the whole thing. So you and your buddies turn up there and everything unfolds from that. What's super interesting about the scenario 
is you have an evidence deck that you'll pull from and you grab two pieces of B, so the second half of it is suddenly entirely different. And there's ten different scenarios based on how these combine. Really good value for money. It's suitably challenging because it, it's a standalone. It's generally recommended that you play with slightly advanced decks because the standalones are a bit harder. I have with no extra XP spent. But yeah, that's my recommendation is if you wanted to get into Arkham, be aware you're going to spend and spend and spend, but also that the new model is better than it's ever been. And Murder's, Murder at the Excelsior Hotel is the single best investment you could make. You could probably just get the core game uh, for a long time. So... That's uh, that's it. I'm going to come back to it once I've played Dunwich a few more times. But I'm going to say at the moment, I don't think Dunwich is getting a big thumbs up from me. Um, it, it's well, well, I'll get into it at some point in the future. But uh, yeah, because no one has a gold pocket watch or a red clock, that means we are out of time for this podcast. Thank you for listening to The Last Standee. You can catch us over at www.patreon.com forward slash the last standee or follow us as the last standee or one word on twitter or you can subscribe subscribe on your preferred pod and alexis from belgium au revoir and myself and remember that the second e in standee is for esoteric <laughs> <laughs>